For almost a year now, Ronald had been waking up in the morning, taking a photo of a beautiful woman in an evening dress from the bedside table and looking at it for a few minutes. He then says, Well, Linda, another day has come without you. Wendy and I miss you so much. He couldn't accept the idea that his beloved Linda was gone. They met when they were both 18. After entering the same course at medical school, they fell madly in love at first sight and never parted again. Both of them came from humble backgrounds, and both of their mothers brought them up alone. So at the end of their first year, they quietly got married, inviting only their mothers and classmates as witnesses. Ronald, realizing the responsibilities of being a husband and a family man, got a part-time job as an orderly. During the day, he studied, and at night, he went to the central hospital three times a week. He did everything possible to ensure that his Linda had everything she needed. The medical school supported the young family and allocated a separate room in the dormitory, which Linda quickly made comfortable and homely. They lived soul to soul. Ronald could not remember a single quarrel they had had in all these years. In her last year of study, Linda told her husband that she was pregnant. Ronald, hearing this joyful news, picked up his wife and, kissing her, began to spin her around the room. Linda, laughing merrily, then said, "'What are you doing? Put me down, you naughty boy. You will soon be a daddy, and you need to prepare seriously.' Linda carried her pregnancy easily, and even in the last few months, she had got her diploma. Ronald got a job in an ambulance after graduation, while Linda, having given birth to their daughter, focused on taking care of their home and child. Ronald cannot remember exactly when his wife started feeling unwell. She began to suffer from severe headaches, but when he begged her to go to the clinic, she always brushed him off saying that it would pass. However, when their daughter turned one year old, Ronald finally persuaded his wife to go for an examination. The diagnosis sounded like a verdict, and according to the doctors, it was not subject to appeal. Time was lost. All that was left was to wait for the unhappy end. Ronald could not believe what he had heard. Then and now, even after the passage of time, he could not forgive himself for not forcing his wife to be examined at the first complaints about her. Although, according to the experts, there was nothing that could be done, Ronald did his best to take care of his wife. He himself made drips and injections. At night, with every breath she took, he was ready to provide any help. With his medical knowledge, he understood that all his labours were in vain, but his heart hoped that love and care could create a miracle, and Linda would live. But no matter how much he believed in it, one morning Linda, his beloved wife, was gone. She died quietly in her sleep, without a single moan or sigh. Waking up, Ronald almost immediately realized that a terrible thing had happened. He did not remember how long he sat at his wife's bedside, rocking her from side to side, with a lump in his throat, that prevented him from bursting into tears. Everything after that was like a dream, as if it didn't happen to him. The funeral, the wake, Wendy's crying, insisting on seeing her mother and saying, I want my mummy, I want my mummy. She tugged at her father, crying silently and not realising with her childish mind that something irreparable had happened. Begged, Daddy, where is mummy? Let's go to mum. Ronald didn't know how to explain to a three-year-old child that her mother was gone and would never be around again. So he told her something about the sky, where her mum would now live. Wendy perplexedly asked, Why didn't she take us with her? Didn't she say she loved us? Ronald, wiping his tears, explained that it was so, but how mum would be taking care of and protecting them from above. What else could he say to a little child? The first six months after his wife's death felt like hell. Whenever she could, Ronald's mother came to help with her granddaughter. He had not seen his mother-in-law since the funeral, 
When he called her once, she gave a short answer. I'm fine. I just want to be alone. But one day, arriving at the cemetery, he did not recognize her. The woman, who appeared to be ten years older, was adjusting the flowers on the grave with trembling hands. Having lost her only daughter, she had gone from a blooming fifty-one-year-old woman to a thin, grey-haired old woman overnight. Immersed in his grief, Ronald never once thought that his mother-in-law was in much more distress and might need help. They sat on the bench by the grave for a long time that day, and Ronald persuaded his mother-in-law, Helen, you can't let this kill you. Your face shows it. You're putting yourself in the coffin. Linda will not return, and you have a granddaughter who is growing up. The woman suddenly looked up at him with eyes full of tears, and, after silently looking at him for a couple of minutes, quietly asked, How is she? I would like to visit you on weekends, if you don't mind. Well, of course, Ronald immediately replied, Of course, she is your only granddaughter, who loves you very much and is waiting for you. On the weekend, she really came to visit. Ronald was surprised at the changes that had taken place. The woman's hair was dyed a beautiful brown colour. Instead of a black, faded floor-length dress, she was wearing a grey pantsuit. Ronald was at home and, opening the door, said cheerfully, "'Good afternoon. Helen, you look great. This hair colour suits you very well. By the way, we were just about to have breakfast. Please join us.' The woman, timidly stepping into the apartment, quietly replied, "'Thank you very much. I won't be long. I really wanted to see you.' Hearing a familiar voice from the hallway, Wendy immediately ran in and shouted joyfully, "'Grandma has come!' Where have you been? I missed you. Grandma, I cried at night. I dreamt about Mummy and Daddy said she's gone far away. You're not going away, are you? The little girl gibbered incessantly and Helen, embracing her and holding back her tears, barely audibly answered, Well, of course not, dear. I will always be there for you. And your Mummy from above looks at you and rejoices. You're such a beauty and growing up so quickly. Ronald abruptly turned around and went to the kitchen, ostensibly to put the kettle on. In fact, he turned it off only before his mother-in-law came. He just couldn't listen to their conversation any more, fearing of bursting into tears. From that day on, Helen began to visit them often and was very helpful, staying overnight with Wendy on the days when Ronald had duty. On one of these days, Ronald left for his shift, knowing that Helen had taken her granddaughter to her place. The day was more or less calm, but closer to evening, the calls started coming one after another. For example, an elderly woman in her eighties called, claiming that she was dying and her blood pressure and pulse were through the roof. Then there was a man with a pre-infarcation condition who could not be taken away because of a fight between teenagers at the entrance. Thank God everything turned out well, and they managed to bring him to the hospital. Then, when it seemed that nothing new would happen that evening, there was a call from the most exquisite restaurant in the city. The bride was sick at the wedding, and no one could explain what had happened. The ambulance driver smiled wryly, and getting behind the wheel said, well, let's go and see where the richest people in the city go. Yeah, we will, said the elderly paramedic angrily. Someone is always getting beaten up at weddings. The bride, or her guests, can also be sick from too much alcohol on such an important day. Trust me, I've seen all kinds of newlyweds. A couple of times, we've barely saved the happy newlyweds. When the paramedics entered the restaurant, the wedding was in full swing. There was cheerful music and some jokes from the Toastmaster. Literally, in the first second, a man rushed towards them. Judging by the flower stuck in a special buttonhole on the lapel of his jacket, it was the groom. Ronald immediately disliked him. The groom's reddened, sweaty face and running eyes caused an incomprehensible dislike in the paramedic. The groom took Ronald under his elbow and, leading him aside, said quietly, I'm sorry there's been a misunderstanding, 
My bride became ill at some point, apparently overexcited. One of the guests called for you. During the conversation, the man tried to smoothly lead Ronald to the exit, which did not please the paramedic. It was clear that the groom was not telling him something or wanted to hide something. Let us examine the bride after all, Ronald suggested insistently. Come on, she's already much better. You probably have normal patients waiting for you. I understand everything, and I'm even ready to pay you for a false call. Saying this, he pulled out a weighty stack of banknotes from his pocket and added, I hope there's enough here for you and your colleagues. Noticing that Ronald was not going to take the money, he then said, I can also pack you some food, wine, champagne. Come home, make your family happy, and drink to our health with your wife. At the mention of his wife, Ronald literally twitched with distaste for this slippery man. It was unclear to the paramedic why this newlywed was suddenly so fussy and literally trying to get the medics outside. He clearly did not want them to see his bride. Ronald was very suspicious and decided to make sure that the woman was all right. Silently nodding to the paramedic standing next to him, he went to the place where the wedding was taking place. The guests appeared to have been celebrating for hours. Some of them were dancing in the centre of the hall, while others continued to raise glass after glass. The tables were bursting with abundance. Swallowing saliva, Ronald remembered that they had not even had time to have lunch that day. He drank only a cup of coffee and ate a sandwich. Finally, he saw the bride sitting at the head of the table, obviously not feeling well. The young woman leaned on the back of the chair, and her head was lying on her crossed arms. The veil had moved off and closed her face. However, when Ronald came closer, he pulled back the thin lace from her head to see whether she was conscious or not. He almost immediately shrieked he couldn't believe his eyes. For a moment it even seemed to him that it was his wife Linda. If he hadn't been at the funeral, he would have thought it was her. After standing for a few seconds, it became clear that, of course, it was not Linda, but the resemblance was striking. After examining the woman, Ronald realised that she had had a strong allergic reaction to something in the food. Her face and hands were covered with red spots. When he asked her to open her mouth, his suspicion was confirmed. The bride was literally in a semi-conscious state. Any delay could lead to swelling of the larynx, and if not treated in time, even death. Noticing that the bride had opened her eyes, Ronald asked, Are you allergic to any food? What did you eat today? You probably have an allergic reaction to some food. Has it happened before? Maybe to fish, citrus, nuts or mushrooms? What have you eaten today? The girl answered in a low voice, Yes, I'm allergic to seafood, but Tony, my husband, said he warned the chefs. By this time, the music had already been turned off, and all the guests and caterers were watching with excitement. Ronald turned around and saw a group of people in black with white button uniforms, among whom stood out a grey-haired tall man in a white starched cap. The paramedic beckoned him over and asked, Are you the chef? Tell me, among the dishes on the table, is there any seafood? Either as a whole or as a sauce or addition to other dishes. The man shrugged his shoulders and said in surprise, Sure, just like it was ordered to. What's the matter? Seafood is in almost everything, except for the cake and dessert. I was told that there will be many fans of mussels, shrimps and other delicacies in the hall, only I was asked also to grind everything as fine as possible to let the guests guess where and what was added. Who? Who asked you to do that? Almost shouted Ronald, realising that in this way the bride could be exposed to a maximum number of allergens. The chef spotted the groom in the hall and nodding his head in his direction said, He asked me about that. The newlywed turned pale. Large drops of sweat appeared on his forehead, but he quickly realised he was indignant. What nonsense! I said to add only to one salad. 
which was to be put only on the tables of the guests, not as. Yes, I remember exactly what I said about not adding seafood. Why, do you need ears, you moron? The groom walked quickly to his bride and kissed her pale hand. At this moment, Ronald again caught himself thinking that he was disgusted with their type. He was clearly a good actor, and for a moment, Ronald was even ready to believe that the cook had misunderstood the order, but immediately, remembering how the groom tried to escort them out of the restaurant, he thought that it was clearly not for nothing, and he was somehow involved in the poisoning of his wife. Ronald suggested hospitalising the bride, but the newly married man sharply replied, "'Thank you, we'll do it ourselves by our own efforts. Are you agreed with me, my love? You gave her a shot, you see? It's already easier. We'll take it from here.' It is necessary to perform a stomach lavage and a course of drips to completely remove allergens from the body, and at home you are unlikely to be able to do this, began to explain the paramedic. Ronald insisted on hospitalization, saying that the action of drugs will give temporary relief, and if you do not cleanse the body completely from toxins, it may worsen. The groom resisted for some time, but the persistence of the paramedic and the persuasion of the excited guests did their job, and he and his bride eventually consented. However, he did not even agree to go with them, saying, You do realise that someone will have to end up our wedding party? I can't leave our guests alone. Ronald wondered how a supposedly loving and caring husband could think about this when his wife was in such a serious condition. But on the other hand, he was even glad that this type would not go with them. He liked the dodgy groom less and less by the minute. Finding himself alone in the ambulance with the woman, Ronald could not help but notice the painfully familiar facial features. While the patient lay there with her eyes closed, he thought that there was many similarities with Linda. The only difference was the girl seemed a little older than his wife. The injection given in the restaurant relieved the patient's condition, and she could already talk. Filling out the necessary documents for hospitalization, Ronald learned that her name is Michelle, and she is two and a half years older than Linda. Michelle told him that she owned a large business, inherited from her father, a well-known businessman in town, who owned a woodworking company and a chain of construction stores. A few years ago, he died suddenly of a heart attack, and she inherited all of it. And what about Mum? Ronald asked. Is your mother still alive? No, replied Michelle sadly. I have never seen her at all. Dad did not like to talk about it, and only my nanny, who brought me up, once said that she died very young, supposedly from some disease. She didn't say what it was, and that's all I know. So I'm the only one in the whole family, Michelle finished sadly, but then smiled and added, although now I'm married and have a husband, Tony is an excellent man and he loves me. Ronald did not express his assumptions about this man, deciding to check everything thoroughly. When they reached the clinic, his duty was ending, and knowing that his daughter was under the care of her grandmother, he decided to stay with Michelle for a while. She immediately underwent all the necessary tests and was put in a ward with a drip. Ronald decided to wait for the results, and when the attending doctor entered the ward, he asked him to step out to the corridor to talk. At that moment, he did not want to confirm his assumptions and upset the patient, as she was still weak. The tests indicated that the level of the allergenic product in her blood was so high that it was a wonder how she survived at all. If the patient had consumed even a little more food with the allergy-causing product, you wouldn't have gotten her here, and probably already at the restaurant, you would have pronounced her dead, summed up the doctor. Ronald did not pass on what he had heard when he returned to the room. He only smiled and said, Well, you will live. Exactly, and that's the main thing. But you just need to lie here for a couple of days to remove all the toxins from your body. They'll give you IVs, vitamins, and you'll come out as good as new. And I'll visit you here 
whenever possible, if you don't mind, of course. She smiled and replied, Of course not, thank you very much. If it weren't for you, I thought I'd die right there in the restaurant. I still don't understand what happened to me. Tony said that he chose the menu himself and negotiated with the chefs. Ronald shrugged his shoulders and, already approaching the door, said, Well then, apparently not everything was properly negotiated. By the way, for now, if your spouse takes the food to you, refrain from eating it. At least while you are in the hospital, eat only hospital dietary food. In your case, the most important thing right now is the right diet. Okay, okay, sure, and thank you again. After leaving the hospital, Ronald went to see his mother-in-law. He realized that Michelle resembled his late wife for a reason. Only Helen could reveal the secret of this resemblance. Ronald knew that after the death of her daughter, she often felt unwell, and memories of Linda were very painful for her. Usually, he tried not to discuss the past, but now it was vital for him. Ronald really wanted to solve the puzzle, so almost from the threshold, saying hello, he asked, Helen, tell me, did Linda by any chance have a sister? The woman looked at him fearfully, and sitting down on a chair, answered somehow uncertainly, What are you saying, Ronald? Where would she come from? You know that Linda was my only child. Please, let's not go back to this topic. Let's go and have some tea. She put the kettle on, but Ronald, seeing that something had frightened the woman, decided not to retreat. Just today, on a call, I met a girl very similar to Linda, he said, carefully watching his mother-in-law's reaction. She was tense, obviously worried, as evidenced by her hands that were not in place. She was smoothing the tablecloth. Then she started going through the candies in a vase on the table. Ronald did not take his eyes off her and started talking again. In the first few minutes, I even thought that this was my Linda revived, but then I realized that this was an entirely different woman, only very, very similar, and as it turned out, a few years older. By the way, her name is Michelle. How is this possible? At that moment, Ronald saw tears streaming down the woman's cheeks and fearing for her health. He quickly fetched some sedative drops from the cupboard that he had given her a couple of times before. She took the medicine with a trembling hand. Ronald said that it was very difficult for her to start a conversation, but he was ready to wait as long as it took just to find out the truth. For about five minutes, Helen sat silently, folding her hands in her lap, and then quietly began to speak. Once upon a time, I came to this city from the countryside. My parents died in a car accident when I was not yet five. I was raised by my grandmother. After graduating from school, I dreamed of going to a college, but life took a different course. That year, when the last bell of school rang for me, my grandmother became very ill and went blind. Of course I could not leave her, so I got a job on a farm and stayed in the village, saying goodbye to my dream of becoming a teacher. For two whole years, from dawn to dusk, I worked in the cowshed, and then all night long I was on duty at my grandmother's bedside. At the time, I thought it would never end like that. And then I buried my only close person and was left all alone. There was nothing to keep me in the village any more, so I went to the city. It seemed to me that life here was much better and easier, so I decided to start from scratch. When my granny was still alive, having learned about my dream to leave, she wrote a note to some very distant relative with a request to help me if possible. Right from the train station, I went to the address on the back of the note. I wasn't certain if this person still lived there, but I was lucky. Mary, whom I had a hard time finding, immediately agreed to help me and even sheltered me for the first time. At that moment she lived alone. Her husband had died and her two sons were military men serving in different parts of the country. Mary worked in a well-to-do family as a housekeeper and after a few days she arranged for me to stay in the house of a businessman. The cottage was big and beautiful. I had only seen such houses on TV before, and the family consisted of only three people, very kind and completely simple in communication. 
Mr. and Mrs. Griffin and their little daughter immediately became dear to me. Initially, they took me in as a housekeeper, but after a month, having looked closely, they offered me to be a full-time babysitter for their little girl. I gladly agreed, because, in this case, I did not have to think about where to live and pay for housing. The daughter of the owners was an angel, did not cause any trouble. Mr. and Mrs. Griffin treated me very well, and I tried to do everything perfectly. They became like family to me. Mrs. Griffin treated me not as a servant, but as a friend. We often, in the evenings when Mr. Griffin was at work, drank tea and chatted about everything. On one such evening, Mrs. Griffin, smiling enigmatically, said, Helen, I went to the doctor today and found out I'm pregnant again. I want to make my husband happy. He has wanted a son for a long time. I was pleased with this news and prayed that God would give them a boy. Helen was silent as if remembering that time. Ronald poured a glass of water and handed it to her, and she looked at him gratefully, took a sip and continued. Mr. Griffin then, of course, was thrilled to learn such news, surrounded his wife with increased attention and care. However, after a while, learning the result of the ultrasound, he was a little upset. The study indicated that the family would again have a girl, but then he began to calm his wife, saying that they could still have a whole soccer team. Mrs. Griffin laughed for a long time and said that with such a husband, she was ready for anything. And in due time, Mr. Griffin took his wife to a good clinic, and we began to wait, preparing to meet the baby. On the day when Mrs. Griffin went into labour, Mr. Griffin couldn't find a place, as if he had a premonition of something. He wandered from corner to corner, waiting for the call. He had called the ward three times before, every half an hour, and they told him not to worry. They said he'd get a call as soon as the labour was over. I tried to calm him down as best I could. I said that this was the second time that they had gone through this, so everything would be fine. But it was like he didn't hear me. I will always remember that phone call. Mr. Griffin picked up the phone and after listening to the speaker on the other end, he slumped to the floor, continuing to hold the phone, began to howl. Helen stopped talking and looked at Ronald with eyes full of tears, and then continued. You can't imagine what a terrible scream came out of his chest. I then, without guessing about anything, one thing was clear, something terrible had happened. I gave him something sedative. I called the hospital. After explaining the situation, I learned that Mrs. Griffin could not give birth for a long time. Doctors spent several hours trying to help her. In the end, the baby was saved, and Mrs. Griffin passed away at that hour. You can't imagine how much Mrs. and Mr. Griffin loved each other. The loss of his wife was an irreparable loss for the man. In the first days after the tragedy, I was even afraid that he went crazy. But thank God it did not happen. Gradually he returned to work. We took the newborn from the maternity hospital but the owner literally hated this child. Every time he saw her at home, he clenched his fists and tears came to his eyes. Sometimes he called the little girl a monster who killed his wife, or angrily said that he'd rather his wife had survived than the little girl. And once, a couple of weeks after his wife's funeral, he said that he intended to give the newborn to the orphanage because he didn't want to see her in his house. I cried all the next night. I felt so sorry for the innocent child. The girl was very much like Mrs. Griffin. Apparently, it reminded the owner even more of what had happened. In the morning, I tried to persuade him again, but realising that he would not change his mind, I asked him to give the girl to me. Ronald did not even notice how he took a glass of water from the table, brought by his mother-in-law, and took a few greedy sips. His mouth was dry from excitement. He could not believe what he had heard. But Helen could no longer stop and continued. I then begged to provide the opportunity to know motherhood. I even told him that after school, meeting with a young man, got pregnant but had a miscarriage, as a result of which the doctor said that I could not give birth. Mr. Griffin was so angry with the little girl that 
that he did not hesitate to say that the main thing, for him, was not to have this girl in his house. I was surprisingly quickly formalized guardianship over Linda. That's when I gave her that wonderful name. Leaving the house of a businessman with a child in my arms, I promised her the best mother, and I made him promise never to think of us or look for us. He said he'd be happy to do that. And that's the way it's been all these years. I never saw him or Linda's older sister again. I raised Linda alone. I was happy when you got married and gave birth to my granddaughter, and then my Linda was gone. That's how she was given to me by God, and taken away, ultimately, Helen said, and tears ran down her cheeks. Ronald sat thinking over what he had heard. It turned out that the bride from the wedding, saved by him, was an elder sister of his dead wife. From the first moment he saw her there, in the restaurant, he realized that this could not be a mere coincidence, and now it had been confirmed. The girls were sisters who did not know of each other's existence. Leaving his mother-in-law's house, Ronald sat on the bench outside for a long time and thought about his wife. He was sorry that all this became known after Linda's death. She, poor thing, had never learned that her older sister lived in the same city. Deciding not to delay and tell Michelle everything, he went to the hospital the next morning. By a strange coincidence, while he was waiting for the bus, his gaze was attracted to a couple kissing in a parked black car. The man's face seemed familiar to Ronald. What was his surprise when the yesterday's groom from the restaurant got out of the car. He no longer resembled a fussy, with running eyes, spouse of the poisoned woman. He was a sweet-tempered man, hurrying to open the door in front of a beloved woman, a young, long-legged blonde, who resembled Michelle in no way, sprang out onto the sidewalk. The lovebirds were kissing, without shying away from anyone, and cooing merrily about something. The girl was literally hanging on to her bow, wrapped around his neck. Ronald was shaken to his core. What a scoundrel this Tony had turned out to be. No sooner had the wedding made a stir than he managed to put his wealthy wife in the hospital and began squandering money on young beauties. Now, Ronald had almost no doubt that this rascal had married for calculation and, having poisoned his wife, hoped to seize all of her fortune. After watching the couple in love at the door of the expensive restaurant where they had entered, Ronald drove to the hospital to visit Michelle. He hadn't decided whether he would tell her about what he had seen, but he would definitely tell her about her sister and her life. When he opened the door to her ward, he was surprised to find an old woman asleep in Michelle's place. Ronald quietly closed the door and went to the resident's room. The attending physician was sitting at the table and wrote something. Upon recognizing Ronald, he greeted him and said, Sorry, I was unable to stop your ward. She started feeling better and insisted on being discharged. She tried calling her husband for a long time, but unsuccessfully. She took a cab and left. Doctor, please give me her address, Ronald begged. Seeing his colleague's bewilderment, he tried to explain as quickly as possible. He has an affair with another girl. I'm certain that everything happened at the wedding was not a coincidence. I'm afraid he will try and get rid of her again. Please give me her address. After a brief moment of thought, the doctor wrote the address on the piece of paper and handed it to Ronald with the words, Only as a colleague to a colleague, and please don't do anything foolish there. And if you do, call me. My phone number is below the address. Thanking the doctor, Ronald quickly left the hospital and only then realized that Michelle's house was at the opposite end of the city. Getting the cab, he was fearful that her husband would have time to harm her before he arrived. Soon, he reached the right neighborhood and thanking the cab driver got out of the car. Approaching a high fence with a heavy steel gate, the man took hold of the carved handle and realized that the gate was not closed. Hearing some fussing and whispering in the yard, he saw a decent gap between the links of the fence and nestling into it, he couldn't believe his eyes. Tony and his mistress were diligently trying to push into the trunk something bulky 
wrapped from all sides, either with covers or sheets. Ronald was afraid to even think of the worst, but decided not to do anything himself and to call the police. When Ronald had gotten a decent distance from the cottage, he tried to call for help. However, the connection was fragile and it took about five minutes for Ronald to finally get through. To his surprise, the police arrived rapidly. Michelle's husband and his mistress were taken aback by the sudden arrival of the police. They watched in silence as the car was searched and the house was thoroughly examined, but the supposed corpse was nowhere to be found. It turned out that they had loaded the car with items of considerable value, including a few paintings, precious figurines and jewellery. Who gave you the right to dispose of your wife's property? While she is in the hospital, you're like a rat taking everything you can. And that, by the way, obviously doesn't belong to you. Where's Michelle? And on what grounds do you run her house without her knowledge? The unfortunate husband, as if remembering, squared his shoulders and grinned. With all his artistry, he replied immediately, What's all this panic? I'm Michelle's lawful husband, and she asked me to take these things out. He looked at his confused girlfriend and said cheerfully, And she asked me to take them to her. He nodded towards the girl. This is Michelle's distant relative. She has just brought an apartment. Michelle, out of kindness, decided to give her all this. Ronald was once again amazed at how this slippery character easily managed to get out of any the most ridiculous situation. This time, too, the police officers saw nothing illegal in his actions, checked his documents and left. Ronald felt that there was something wrong. While he had been getting here and dealing with the law enforcers, Michelle could have come here a hundred times already. The attending doctor heard that she had called a cab to this very address. There could be no doubt Michelle was here, and those scoundrels had done something to her. But the question of where they were hiding her remained unclear to him. One thing was certain, they could not have taken her far during this time, and Ronald decided to see what they would do next. And he didn't have to wait long. Half an hour later, Tony walked out onto the porch in some unthinkable fisherman's garb. His girlfriend appeared behind him in a robe. The girl was not going anywhere and was probably just seeing him off. Ronald was glad that earlier he had found a place from which the entrance to the house was clearly visible, and it was even possible to make out what they were talking about. Honey, the girl said resentfully, when will it end? You promised you would get married, and then you'd get rid of her immediately. Tony kissed the blonde and affectionately replied, Be patient a little longer, kitten. Since the wedding didn't work out, we'll use plan B. Do you think I like walking to the backwards damn village? There are no roads at all. It takes half an hour to get there through the mud and swamp. At least no one will know to look for her there. In a couple of days, I'll file a missing persons report on her, saying that she left the clinic voluntarily, without being treated, and that something happened to her head and that she didn't come home. The police don't need such hang-ups for nothing. They'll quickly close the case, and if necessary, we'll give them money. The lovers kissed passionately and were obviously satisfied with themselves. Tony added, Now, I'll just check that there's no chance of her escape. We'll tie her up tight and go to the city. The girl said in the voice of an aggrieved child, Honey, can't you speed up her sad end? I really like this house. The man suddenly cut her off, saying, "'Have you gone mad? What are you pushing me into? "'No, I tried it once. It didn't work. "'Let things go on as they are. "'And you, go into the house and wait.' Tony walked towards the gate, and Ronald, afraid of being noticed, quickly stepped aside, hiding behind the nearby bushes. The thorny plants scratched his hands and face painfully, but he endured it silently. As soon as the villain turned the corner, carefully hiding behind the trees, Ronald followed him. He was glad that it was already twilight, and he, wearing a black tracksuit, was less noticeable. They left the neighborhood, and the unfaithful spouse turned towards the dense forest. As a child, Ronald often went hiking, and he and his friends always left some signs on the trail so that it would be easy to get out in case they got lost. And now, he tore his t-shirt at the entrance to the forest and tied the shreds to visible places on the trees to find the way back. Ronald's shoes were clearly 
not designed for hiking through the swampy forest, and after about ten minutes, he realized why the villain ahead of him was wearing fishing boots. Ronald's legs were wet and muddy, covered with swamp silt above his knees. The sneakers were unbearable. He was thinking of taking them off, but at some point, stepping in the darkness on a protruding bow, he almost cried out in pain and immediately changed his mind. In the darkness, he tried to tread quietly and was glad that Tony, who was walking twenty meters ahead, was lighting his way with a lantern, the glow of which was a beacon for the paramedic. Ronald did not know how long they walked, but it was certainly not less than half an hour. Eventually, they arrived at a village in the forest. Five almost ruined houses stood among the trees. It was clear that no one could live there. One had no roof at all, and another had broken windows scattered on the ground. In the evening light, everything looked bleak. Ronald thought that people hadn't lived in these places for many years. As if he sensed something, Tony stopped and looked around, shining his flashlight. One second more, and the beam would have illuminated Ronald, who had no time to hide. But someone from above decided to help him. The flashlight, blinking sharply, turned off. What a mess! The road is not visible, and now this misfortune. Tony swore angrily. It was heard as he spat and began to rustle in his backpack. In a minute, he took out another flashlight and switched it on. Then he headed for the smallest hut, shriveled from time. The door of the hut hung literally on one hinge. One window was a black hole, and the other was covered with grey cardboard. Ronald began to look for an opportunity to see what was going on inside, and this time he was lucky again. At the ajar window, one corner remained uncovered, and he nestled against it. What he saw shocked him. Michelle was sitting on the dirty floor, leaning against the wall, trying to say something to Tony, but the gag that tightly covered her mouth made it hard to understand her. Her rogue husband, pulling out a rope from his knapsack, began to speak with hatred. Why are you making noises? I'm fed up with you. Did you really think that I could love such a grey mouse like you? All my life, I've loved bright, crazy girls, not the well-read fools. If it weren't for your father's condition, I wouldn't even have looked at you. Michelle tried to twitch weakly with her bound hands and kept up her attempts to utter something, but all was in vain. Don't move. Nothing will save you now. Quietly, without disturbing anyone, you'll die here. And I, a grief-stricken widower, will inherit all your money legally. But rejoice, you'll sleep forever in the lap of nature, amidst the singing of birds, oblivious to predators, unless, of course, they find you before you die. Ronald didn't know what he should do. On the one hand, he wanted to tear this scoundrel right here on the spot. On the other hand, he realized that he would never do it, but he definitely needed to punish the villain. Ronald began to think about what to do. It was necessary to catch Tony red-handed, otherwise he could slander him and Michelle. Ronald realized that Tony was not going to kill Michelle here and now, which meant he had some time to call the police again. After moving away from the hut, Ronald called them again. When they heard that it was an overly suspicious paramedic who had called them earlier today, the police didn't want to take him seriously, but Ronald didn't give up. He told them about the abandoned village and that he had seen a bound woman on the floor, and he also threatened a prosecutor's audit if they did not react. Only then did the policeman agree to come. Ronald literally ran after the policeman, finding the right way by his marks. When he came out of the thicket, they were already waiting for him. Ronald waved to them and led them to the abandoned houses, telling them everything he had seen. Already on the approach to the crime spot, they met a surprised Tony. He was shocked and did not know what to do. When the police announced that they were here because of the information about the kidnapping, Tony laughed hysterically, apparently turning on the actor again. "'What kidnapping? What are you talking about?' he began in a trembling voice. "'I was just going to the woods to relax. Is that forbidden now?' Ronald looked at him with hatred and hissed, "'Uh-huh. Relaxing at night in the woods?' 
I hope you didn't give your wife another horse dose of poison. Ronald clenched his fists, trying to restrain himself from hitting this scoundrel. Tony felt the power of his hatred and decided to keep silent, saying nothing more. So, in complete silence, accompanied by police officers, they reached the house where Michelle was hidden. The woman looked very pale, even in nightlight, and Ronald was afraid for her. When the captive's hands and feet were untied and the gag was removed, she looked at Ronald with tears in her eyes and whispered in a barely audible voice, "'Thank you so much. You saved me again. Thank you.' "'You're welcome. It turns out that you are not a stranger to me, in the truest sense of the word. But we'll talk about that later. Currently, you need to be taken to the clinic right away.' Ronald replied, helping her up. However, as she staggered, Michelle almost fell. Looking around, he turned to the policeman and asked, "'Guys, can you please help me carry? I'll try to build something like a stretcher.' They nodded and Ronald quickly made something like a stretcher out of sticks and some old rags. One of the policemen fastened handcuffs on Tony's hands, ignoring his indignation, and ordered him to go forward. Ronald and the second policeman took the stretcher on which Michelle was sitting and walked, orientating themselves by the lantern of those ahead of them. Surprisingly, they reached the entrance to the neighbourhood quickly enough, where ambulances and police cars were already waiting for them. Tony was trying to prove his innocence to the policemen, but they said something strict to him, and he sharply shut up and climbed into the open door of a special vehicle with bars. One of the policemen who helped to carry Michelle approached the ambulance in which the poor captive was already laid down. He held out his hand to Ronald, who was sitting next to the poor woman, and said, I apologize for the fact that we did not believe you at the first arrival, and thank you for not stopping despite everything. And addressing Michelle, he added, You are lucky to have a saviour, and you cannot worry about your scoundrel husband, he and his girlfriend will be punished to the fullest extent of the law. I think in the next few years, they'll be able to see free sky. The officer left and Michelle looked gratefully at Ronald and spoke a little audibly. You've had enough of me. Maybe you won't go to the hospital. Your wife is probably waiting for you. Hearing the mention of Linda, he swallowed a lump and after a little silence answered, I have no wife. It's been several years since she died. Putting his palm on the girl's hand, he smiled sadly and continued, Now, I certainly won't let you check out early, and I'll try to see to it. Michelle smiled and exhausted closed her eyes. At the hospital, she was put under the doctor's control, and Ronald finally went home. He arrived when it was nearly 2 a.m. and had to be up for duty at 6 a.m., as he looked into his daughter's bedroom, he saw the grandmother and granddaughter sleeping together. At that moment, he felt grateful that his mum lived nearby and could help him out if needed. After a couple of hours of quick sleep, he got up, brewed himself a cup of coffee, and started getting ready for work. A sleepy mum came out of the nursery and whispered, "'Son, where have you been? What happened? Are you okay?' Ronald hugged his mum and said, "'Thank you for being by my side.' I'm sorry, I had a monster day yesterday, and I ended up staying out late, but everything is fine now, thank you. His mother smiled and gave him a kiss before going to her granddaughter's bedroom. At that moment, Ronald envied them both, for they could have slept for another hour and a half. Without even having breakfast, he went to work. For the first couple of hours, his mind was on Michelle. He wanted to go to the clinic where she was lying, but work was too intensive. During his lunch break, he called the clinic to find out how Michelle was feeling. She felt much better, and the nurse on duty even said that she had enjoyed breakfast. After his shift, he stopped by the daycare centre to pick up his daughter and immediately hurried to the hospital. On the way, he explained to Wendy that they were going to check on her aunt, who was very sick. His daughter, in a stupor, asked, "'Sick like Mum? Will the aunt also go to heaven?' The question was like a stab in the heart for Ronald. He stopped immediately and took his daughter in his arms to explain. 
No, sweetie. Auntie will be okay, and we'll help her do it. We need to visit her, bring her some goodies, and she will definitely recover. The daughter looked at him slyly and asked, Let's buy her my favorite cake, and she will get better right away, you'll see. Ronald laughed. After buying flowers and a cake, they came to the ward. When Ronald opened the door, the doctor stood next to Michelle's bed and scolded her. Hearing the sound of the door opening, he turned around and indignantly said, Ronald, only you can stop her. She came back here again yesterday, and now she cares only about her business and doesn't give a damn about her health. As if giving way to the visitor, the doctor headed for the door, saying menacingly, Talk to this stroppy girl. Seeing Wendy look at him fearfully, the doctor corrected his glasses and added, And take this nice little lady to me. I happen to have a small but delicious pie. Winking at the girl, he left the ward. At that moment, Wendy looked at Michelle for the first time. The little girl's lips trembled. She squeezed her father's hand and faintly asked, Daddy, is it Mummy? Back? Mummy, Mummy! She rushed to Michelle, who was sitting on the bed in bewilderment, and pressing herself against Michelle's chest, began to sob. She cried and through her sobs kept saying, Mummy, don't leave us any more. I feel terrible without you. Michelle, being in shock, automatically stroked the girl's head. Looking at Ronald with a questioning look, she saw that he was also in shock, but gave her some signs. At that moment, the nurse who came in, realising that it was necessary to calm the child, managed to distract her, and talking about something in a whisper, took her out of the room. As soon as they were alone, Ronald told Michelle about her sister, her mother's death, and her father's decision to get rid of Linda. Then they sat and cried as Ronald talked to her about how he had met her sister, how they had loved each other, and how she had suffered before her death. Several years passed. Michelle became an integral part of the lives of Ronald and little Wendy. The man who loved his dead wife fell in love with her sister, and Michelle responded with reciprocity. But having not an excellent experience of marriage, for some time she refused to marry, although Ronald proposed to her several times. Well, it is possible to live independently of the stamps in the passport, she used to say to Ronald, but when she informed him that she was expecting a child from him, he categorically stated, So what, a son will be born without a father? Or maybe you don't like the fact that your husband will be a simple paramedic? He playfully, sternly began to step on Michelle, and she jokingly waved her hands and laughed. I agree, I agree, the happy woman said, wrapping her beloved's arms around him. A year later, in a cottage community outside the city, while the parents were at work, two happy grandmothers fiddled with two twins, and Wendy helped happily as a caring older sister, now and then wiping the boys' noses. <laughs>